uh, on Russia's worlds. The Harriman Institute has scheduled up for this year. Um, today, we are delighted to have uh, for this second session uh, uh, Tatiana Enhoeva and Elizabeth Maguire. Dr. Tatiana Enhoeva is an assistant professor of Japanese history at New York University. Uh, she is native of the Republic of Buratia. Uh, Dr. Enhoeva graduated from uh, Moscow State University, received her MA uh, from the University of Tokyo, and PhD in history from UC Berkeley. She has been awarded fellowships from uh, Japan's Ministry of Education, the Japan Foundation, UC Berkeley, the Hoover Institute, and uh, the German Excellence Initiative. Uh, today, she is going to speak on her first book, which came out last year with Cornell University Press, entitled uh, uh, Revolution Goes East. Uh, uh, and. Uh, um, uh, the second speaker is uh, Dr. Elizabeth Maguire. Elizabeth Maguire is an assistant professor at California State University, East Bay. Her first book uh, is entitled Red at Heart, How Chinese Communists Fell in Love with Russian Revolution. It was published by uh, Oxford University Press in 2018. She has also completed research for her, for her second book, Communist Neverland, History of International Children's Home, 1933-2013, and has published articles in three edited volumes, uh, Everyday Life in Russia, Past and Present, Strategies, Subjectivities, and Perspectives, uh, and A Little Red Book, A Global History of the Quotation of Chairman Mao. Uh, and uh, the third one, uh, The Soviet Impact on China, 1949, uh, 1991. She's going to give her presentation entitled Shoshara uh, Farm uh, Romance in a Soviet Style, uh, which uh, is a part of your uh, uh, book that I mentioned earlier. So, uh, and now um, um, I would like to encourage everyone to post their questions uh, on uh, QA. So, please hit QA button and uh, uh, write your questions, and uh, after the talks, we're going to have uh, a short roundtable and then uh, a short Q&A section. Uh, and now over to Dr. Elizabeth Maguire, uh, please. Talk. <laughs> Talk. <laughs> um, so as, as I can tell you, um, I came up with the title of my talk at the very last minute, <laughs> um, kind of in a rush. Um, but I think as I sat down to think about what to say, it dawned on me that I have spent or did spend like over a decade looking for the woman in Sino-Soviet relationship. Um, and I better have found her <laughs> because I looked for her for so long and I wrote a book. Um, so I really hope that uh, I did find her. Um, so today I wanna to tell you a little bit about why I was looking for her for the first place, in the first place, um, and a little bit about the woman or women that I found. Um, so originally I kind of stumbled on the idea of a woman in Sino-Soviet relations when I was getting a master's degree at Johns Hopkins University. And I took randomly a class on China. I had been a Russian history major at Harvard. So I knew a lot about Russia and the Soviet Union. And I took this class on a lark and I was just stunned to see the similarities between like everything I was seeing about 20th century China you know, especially after 1949, just looked so familiar. You know, it was the look and the feel and the aesthetic. And so I went looking for something that would explain this because it was just, you know, it kind of hit me like, like a, not a bolt of lightning, but you know, it really hit me um, kind of like a ton of bricks. And um, so I started looking for something that would explain this kind of almost intuitive um, or aesthetic feel. And what I found instead were a lot of geopolitical and ideological books, you know, like when Marx was first translated in China and um, Mao and Stalin and 
you know, a lot of really good, you know, fortunately by then there were, the archives were open and, you know, there was a lot of good history, but it wasn't what I was looking for. It didn't explain what I was trying to explain. Um, I also found this was, you know, in 2003 or something. And I was, you know, I didn't find a lot of cross-cultural or sort of transnational um, histories at that time um, between Russia and China. Um, so I was at Berkeley and I didn't speak, read or write Chinese, um, but I was really interested in this. And um, so I gradually, you know, told my professors that I really wanted to do this and to my shock, they were very supportive. And so I started learning Chinese. Um, and, you know, in the course of my perusing the library, you know how you just kind of, when you're starting out, you just kind of go and look at the shelf and all the books on the shelf. I found this book um, and it was a memoir of a woman whose parents had been educated in the Soviet Union and had had her there they were Manchurian revolutionaries and then had gone back um, to, you know, foment revolution and fight Japanese um, aggression in China. And, you know, she then went to live in this children's home that's the subject of my second book. Um, but she and her birth and her parents told me that there was a human method of transmission of revolutionary ideas and but more than ideas like enthusiasm and desire uh, for revolution and that there had been a flow of human beings. To me, what I was seeing couldn't be explained by like Marxism flying through the air or top level leaders, like somewhere along the way, there had to be um, a flow of humans. and her memoir alerted me to the fact that on top of that, there were actually marriages and, and families formed in this environment. And that was more than I expected to find. I didn't expect to find this strong um, kind of romantic uh, experience that I was finding. Um, and so I went off to the Comintern archives um, and I, you know, learned Chinese and started reading and, um, and in fact, I discovered that, you know, again, to my surprise, that there was a lot in there about love and romance. The Soviets kept track of the romantic liaisons amongst their students. So I should back up and say lots of Chinese in the 1920s, including, you know, people who would become many future leaders of the Soviet, I'm sorry, of uh, People's Republic of China and um, Taiwan were in, came to Moscow in the 1920s to special schools just for revolutionaries abroad. Um, and this is where they were having these experiences. And on some level, I mean, these guys were young at this point. They're like, some of them even in their teens. Jiang Jingguo, you know, future president of Taiwan was like 15 when his dad sent him there. And he stayed there till, I can't even remember, like 1939 or something. So um, there was a lot in there, you know, and they were obsessed with the question of love and revolution and relationships and the Soviets actually kept track of it. Um, at the same time, I discovered that there was a literary element to this relationship. Um, and that in fact, it had started in a literary way. Um, and so I wanna share my screen um, for a minute and give you some slides um, that are gonna show you what I mean. Um, let's see if I can get there. Um, All of a sudden, there we go. I've been using Google Docs lately, so PowerPoint has become a little like a language I learned a long time ago. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, the title of my talk, Cherche la Femme, Romance Sino-Soviet Style. Um, and so I wanna talk to you first a little bit about what was going on in literary terms. Um, so there was this thing in China um, in the 1910s called the New Culture Movement. 
And many, you know, they were trying to, you know, it's a kind of complicated story. I don't want to get into the new culture movement, but young Chinese were really adamant about rejecting Confucianism, arranged marriage. And what I found very prominently in some of the memoirs that I was reading was that this was actually a primary driver. You know, it wasn't a secondary driver. Men wanted women that they could love. They, they wanted to marry for love um, and not arranged. And so many scholars focus on this uh, magazine called New Youth Magazine, um, which was launched in 1915 by future Communist Party leader Chen Duxiu. And everybody who had read that, and you know, maybe I've missed somebody, but they focused on, you know, when that magazine was translating Marx and what Chinese really understood about Marx. And so the, the sort of glasses that they were looking at this new youth were, were different from my classes. Um, and this new youth was really a big important thing. I mean, young revolutionaries would like wait in line for the next issue of it. Um, it was central to the new culture movement. But what I found was fascinating um, in the first issue, the very first inaugural issue prominently featured a translation of Turgenev, you know, 19th century, um, <clears throat> novel called Spring Torrents. Um, and the protagonist is a Russian who goes to Europe and falls in love with this, you know, beautiful, innocent daughter of a German, I think it's candy maker. Um, and he woos her away from her German fiance. Um, but then this passionate, free thinking, married Russian noblewoman comes along and seduces him and enchants him um, and he abandons the innocent European girl and lives most of the rest of his life under the spell of this um, free thinking Russian noblewoman. So, you know, if you look at it, Spring Torrance is about a romantic young man who's journeying, you know, to this enlightened Europe. And many, uh, many Chinese did that. And they imagined themselves doing it even if they didn't do it. So Chinese were also going, you know, to France and Germany um, in order to study there and work there. They worked during the day and they studied at night. Um, but even those who didn't go kind of imagined going. Um, but then this, this novel's um, protagonist was kind of lured back hopelessly to the debauched ways you know, of his native land. So it was interesting that, that, that you know, this was what they chose to publish first definitely nothing to do with Marxism, absolutely. Um, and the heroine, and I'm just, I put this picture, I think it's Natasha Kinsky, like, you know, this novel has been adapted to various films, but you can kind of get the sense of just how like sexy and romantic um, this novel was just by, you know, the still from that movie. Um, and that's definitely what you know, from descriptions and whatnot in memoirs and novels, you know, people were, um, the Russian woman in their minds was beautiful. Um, and yet, so this, you know, this woman is an anti-heroine. She's, you know, somebody who's, she's home luring you back when you're trying to become something new. Um, but for Chinese, she was also this kind of new kind of character. She was not like her Chinese counterpart. She was the opposite of an arranged marriage. Um, and Chinese male feminists at that time saw many of their female counterparts as kind of secluded, weakened by Confucian social mores. And then they saw Western European woman, like the daughter of the candy shop guy, um, as constrained by bourgeois morals. And so this woman was what they were looking for. Okay, so this is a purely literary character and she was one of many who would like spring out of the pages of translated Russian literature into Chinese imaginations. And this lasted for a very long time, um, possibly even today. Gradually though, these literary women, they morphed into real women. So in 1917, 
um, you know, year of Russian Revolution, the very first version of Anna Karenina appeared in Chinese. Uh, that was the same year that a future communist uh, called Xu Bai started to study Russian in Beijing. So before that, very few Chinese had spoken or been able to read Russian directly. Tolstoy had been very popular in the 19th century in China and the early 20th century, but as an anarchist thinker. So the Chinese learned about him first through his anarchism and then discovered his novels. By 1917, he was China's most translated Russian novelist. Um, and we know from Xu's memoirs that he not only read Anna Karenina, but he thought all the time about how the terrible fate of Anna, who was stuck in a marriage she didn't like, um, could be solved by having a revolution. So in 1921, this Chu became the first journalist um, to travel to revolutionary Moscow. So a lot of what he wrote was like rehashes of Pravda material, um, uh, but he was an interesting writer. So he could sort of put a spin on things. And he wrote these eyewitness accounts of what he was seeing um, that really could capture imaginations of radical readers um, back home. But there was this very curious part. And again, people who read this memoir tended to look for what he thought about communism, you know, what he thought about the revolution around him. But the trouble was this memoir had this giant section of it devoted to this imaginary romance with the daughter, um, the granddaughter of Tolstoy. Um, so here she is, um, Sophia, and he, he strikes up a friendship with her at a cultural event, prolet cult event. Um, and he visits her home, Tolstoy's, I'm sorry, he visits Tolstoy's country home. Um, and she made a real impression on him. And in his memoir, which he published when he got home, it's called History of the Heart in the Red Capital. And there's, he, he kind of implies that they had a romantic relationship, which I looked and discovered was impossible probably because she was involved with someone else at the time. But I think he did it deliberately. He wanted to um, play on the romanticism with which so many young Chinese were looking at Russian women. Um, and he just knew that nothing could kind of create the kind of frisson, you know, that an imagined but apparently real relationship with Tolstoy's actual flesh and blood granddaughter. Um, he knew the effect that would have on his readers. And he even writes her this poem um, the luminous moon falls into the sea, you know. Physiology is very much like this great waves of desire without boundaries. So he claims that he gave that to her, you know, and who knows if he actually did, but the point is he did this purposefully. I mean, it was clear and it was a very significant part of this memoir. Um, okay, so he makes a name for himself with his travelogue and he goes home and he meets um, sorry, I couldn't remember if I had a picture of her, but I don't. Um, he meets his first wife, who just so happens to be friends with this, you know, forward thinking feminist writer, Ding Ling. Um, and she wrote, wrote in her memoirs about how she and her friend, you know, went to this Shanghai University where she was teaching. Um, and he, you know, in turn made quite an impression on them. And he wooed his first wife by teaching them Russian. And he would read them Pushkin. And they would recite this, these poems. And they both fell in love with him, Dingling and, and his future wife. And the three of them moved in together. And, you know, they kind of created a scandal. So Chu also inspired other young women to travel to Moscow, young Chinese women. Um, and so, you know, basically it was 
it w there was a whole swirl of romance and revolution that was going on in the, the minds of these Chinese. And I am not trying to claim or did not try to claim in my book or anywhere that this was more important than all of the ideological or political stuff. This was just a story that a side of it that I just didn't see anywhere else and that I thought was really fascinating. Um, so, so far in my story, we have like 2.5 um, <laughs> Russian women. We have two fictional ones and we have one actual one, but no real relationships. She's kind of a fictional woman too, right? Because she's Tolstoy's granddaughter. Um, okay. But then as the 1920s went on, um, as I said before, thousands of young Chinese, thousands, um, actually many of them inspired by Chu's writing, came to Moscow to study. And a number of them found Russian girlfriends there. Uh, and really think about it. Like, again, as I said before, there's really nothing unusual about that. Um, you know, study abroad, students often have romances. And then on top of that, there's this overall revolution going on in Chinese culture, um, at least amongst these left-leaning um, young people, rejecting Confucianism. And then in Russia, you know, it's 1920s where it's experimenting with free love and whatnot. Um, and so all of this is just swirling together, two cultures in a kind of romantic upheaval while also hoping for and trying to um, realize revolutionary ideas. Um, and so, as I said before, you know, the archives are just full of these curious and actually often funny stories of relationships between Chinese men and Russian women. Um, and that continued even into the 1930s, you know, when that was more dangerous and, and it was just kind of less free thinking. To me, though, the most interesting of these relationships um, were the ones between prominent Chinese communists and Russian women. Um, and that was because these were romances that were super visible at, you know, really elite levels in both communist parties. And so they had symbolic power. And remember from a title of my talk, you know, so I wasn't looking for women. I wasn't trying to write a social history. Um, I was looking for the proverbial woman, you know. So there are several kinds of relationships like this, but I'm just going to talk to you briefly about one. Um, so this is Elisabetta Kishkina or Lisa, let's just call her Lisa. Um, and so Lisa, just like the fictional heroines, you know, Maria, Anna, and then Sophia, the quasi-fictional one, they'd all been born to noble families. Um, she was born in 1914. And again, this isn't, this is relevant because a lot of these young Chinese were from sort of fallen um, or declining gentry families in China. So there was some sense of, um, what would you call that, you know, um, you could put, they could put themselves in their shoes, put it that way. Um, so later in life, she, she wrote a memoir and she describes the garden of her country estate um, where she spent just like the first three years of her life. She specifically says that the garden is like the garden of the writer Bunyan um, and her own father committed suicide in 1918. Um, so, you know, Lisa's career options in the Soviet Union were super limited because of her family, right? Her noble origins. So she went to Khabarovsk to work in a publishing house. Oh, sorry, I didn't mute my landline. Um, so in Khabarovsk, she falls in with... Sorry, guys, I'll just let that... There we go. Um, Okay, I think it's over. Um, so in Khabarovsk, she falls in with this sort of mixed. Oh my goodness. I'm going to go ahead and hang up on this. Oh, I am so sorry about that interruption. I really apologize. Um, 
Okay, so Lisa, she's in Khabarovsk, and these Chinese men actually seem sophisticated to her. You know, they play tennis and they're very well read and educated. Um, she, she even saw a photo of her future husband who was the famous, you know, very fiery labor agitator, Lili San. She actually saw him on the cover of a Russian magazine in 1925. So she returns to Moscow in the 1930s and she meets Lee who turns out to be this very quiet person, at least at first. He had been married already several times and he seems to have seriously fallen for her. Uh, he undertakes this super serious courtship, you know, taking her ice skating and bringing her presents. Um, all the while he's, you know, doing public penance in the Soviet Union for so-called mistakes that he supposedly made. Um, he was, he had a brief stint as the general secretary of the Chinese Communist Party. Um, and so he also worked at the foreign languages publishing house now in Moscow. Um, so he gave her chocolates and, you know, takes her on boat rides and he tells her stories about, you know, he has studied in France before and spent time organizing Chinese coal miners and running across rooftops to escape the police. Um, so, you know, to young Lisa, this seems like very romantic. Um, so these two marry in 1936 uh, and they have this, you know, brief period of happiness. He's arrested in February of 1938. Uh, her friends and family told her to forget him. They say, you know, he's just a Chinese guy. You just met him anyway, but she doesn't, she's loyal. So she waits in the lines and she sends him 50 rubles a month that, you know, his prison allowed. He was released in 1939, unusually, and allowed to go back to his old job. And so at that point, um, there they are, you know, very much in love. And she gives birth to a daughter, Ina. In 1950, uh, I'm sorry, 45, Lee is called back to China. And there again, his Chinese comrades urge him to find a new wife. He has to leave her behind. Uh, and he refused, you know, and he explained her loyalty, which resonated, you know, loyalty being still an important value in, for Chinese culture. Um, he refused to find a new wife and he insisted that he should send for Lisa and Ina and even Lisa's mother. Okay, so uh, this is progress, right? I have a very real live specific woman at this time. Um, so the, the only trouble with this is that at this point in time, the Chinese revolution seems to be like going back to its beginnings because there's now a second generation of Chinese communists. Um, and if you wanna stop me, um, go ahead and stop me. I'll try to finish up sort of quickly here. Um, so they, you know, these are young people who didn't experience this in the 1920s and they go through a similar process of reading um, Russian novels um, and, you know, finding sex symbols there. So. In the novel Cement, this guy, Wang Meng, who later becomes um, Minister of Culture in China, um, he describes the, the um, heroine as a kind of imaginary sex symbol, he says, that I got from reading. Um, her attitudes towards sex weren't communist, nor were they mainstream in China, but reading Cement gave me a vague yet violent feeling like a field on fire. So again, that kind of tells you um, what was going on in the minds of a second generation of future um, Chinese communists. So he spent his time, you know, he went to ice skating rinks that blared Russian music. He gave a Russian novel to his first girlfriend. She was reading Anna Karenina. Um, and so they were just doing the same thing all over again, reading Russian fiction, listening to Russian music, watching Russian movies and falling in love. Um, it's really well known that the PRC mandated the memorization of certain passages of a famous socialist realist novel, How the Steel Was Tempered. Um, they focused on a special scene where the hero Pavel Korchagin rejects his first love, who's this bourgeois girl named Tonya, in favor of revolution. Um, 
But a scholar besides me pointed out that this had an unintended consequence of really romanticizing Tonya. And so during the Cultural Revolution later, when you know all literature was banned, there were so many millions of copies of cement published in, um, I'm sorry, of how the steel was tempered published in China that this was kind of like the one novel that parents let their kids secretly keep under their pillows. Um, and so Tonya um, became this very, um, you know, widespread romantic figure during the Cultural Revolution. So Lisa goes on to, you know, teach high level Chinese communist cadres, Russian, um, in, and then including even Mao's wife, Jiang Qing. Um, and I'm gonna, you know, skip a little bit here forward. This is the last picture of their family before the Cultural Revolution. And of course, in China during the Cultural Revolution, anything foreign was suspect and especially anything Russian. And here Li has this Russian wife. And so they put her in prison. Um, she was in solitary confinement for eight years. And she survived that by imagining grandchildren. And in fact, um, you know, this, this happened. She got out of prison and she had a grandchild. Um, there she is with him. She lived to be 100 years old, and I met her and interviewed her. Um, so I think what I want to say about the Sino-Soviet split briefly is just that, you know, it showed people focus on the fact that they split. But I'm returning now to the larger significance of all this. So I found the woman. What does it mean? Um, I think that the split showed you know, how powerful each side had become in kind of defining and also constraining the possibilities of the other. I mean, they really became related in a way culturally that hadn't been true before the Russian Revolution. And so I think that, um, you know, the, the funny thing is that this flesh and blood Russian woman and her fictional counterpart, they were never entirely contained by the Sino-Soviet split. You know, they lived on, as I said with Tonya, in Chinese minds as romantic kind of heroines. So in the end, as you see here, China let the real Russian um, woman out, you know, symbolically, China let Lisa out of prison. Um, she's officially rehabilitated. She becomes kind of the first Russian lady of Chinese society. Um, so it was almost as if the Chinese revolution had finally come to terms with the Russian woman who had always been one of the best parts of its story. Um, so that concludes my comments today. Uh, thank you very much, Elizabeth, for a great presentation. Uh, let me uh, let me remind you uh, that you could post your questions by hitting Q&A button, uh, and you are welcome to do so. Uh, and now we are giving floor to uh, Tatiana and Koyova, please. Um, thank you. Um, thank you for inviting me, and I'm so pleased to be um, to give this talk with Elizabeth Maguire. Um, so I will uh, briefly talk about my book, and but I structured my um, uh, talk today around some themes that I find uh, similar with uh, Elizabeth's wonderful book. Um, so my book, um, Japan's, what is it? Revolution Goes East, uh, Imperial Japan and Soviet Communism, um, is about uh, the Japanese responses to the Russian Revolution of uh, 1917. Um, I looked how uh, different political groups uh, in the left and in the right of the political spectrum engaged uh, with Soviet communism and with the Soviet Union. So with the ideology and the state. Um, so like Elizabeth, I uh, examined how international com um, communism uh, was translated into Imperial Japan as an individual experience, as a way of life, and as a personal belief. So I initially examined the debates about the meaning of the revolution among the Japanese left, and I, um, I identified three groups. Uh, so those were the early Japanese Communist Party, the anarchists, and um, national socialists. 
Um, so this picture, uh, as I was researching, this was my dissertation at Berkeley. Um, so this picture was incomplete uh, without looking at um, other groups, other political groups. So those were Japanese liberals and also pan-Asianists, uh, conservative bureaucrats, as well as the Japanese military. Um, but eventually, uh, as I was already working on, on the book manuscript, I realized that uh, geopolitical issues and the issues of foreign policy, the issues of the Soviet-Japanese relations also had a great impact, not only on the Japanese left, but also on the way the Japanese imperial state reacted to Soviet communism. So in other words, I concluded in my book that in Japanese responses to the Russian revolution, both um, geopolitical and ideological factors seem to play an equally important role. Um, so now um, to this, uh, to some uh, themes and um, um, so I will kind of jump from one point to another uh, that I find um, interesting to discuss today. Um, so I will start with some overlapping um, uh, topics. Uh, what I found strikingly similar in Japanese and Chinese uh, thinking about Russia is how two contradictory and opposite perceptions of Russia coexisted together in Japan and China. So on the one hand, um, Russia was a threat. Um, in Japan, since the late 17th century, as the Russians were pushing to the Pacific, you know, uh, colonizing Siberia, and then what later became the Russian Far East, um, they are now engaging with the Ainu population um, um, and, um, and eventually the Japanese. And so there are more and more contacts and, uh, since the late 17th century, and Russia was conceived in Japan um, as a threat. So they, they, they even came up with the term, the special term, the threat from the North, uh, which, you know, some right wing Japanese still use. <laughs> um, so um, modern Japanese history uh, can be examined as the history actually of dealing and containing the Russian, uh, the Imperial Russian and also Soviet uh, power in East Asian region. So in this sense, I argued in my book that uh, Japanese um, uh, policymakers and the public also didn't see much difference between the Imperial Russia and the Soviet Union. Both were the, both were the same, both um, were a uh, threat. Um, so as Imperial Russia pushed its interest in Korea and North Manchuria, um, you know, acquiring some territory from the crumbling Qing China. Um, so, uh, so did the Soviet Union. Um, uh, what made a big impression uh, on the Japanese public and on the Japanese political elite was the loss of Mongolia, by the way. Um, when um, outer Mongolia became um, a Soviet, Soviet Mongolia, uh, by the way, the first Soviet satellite state, um, as well as the Soviet sort of, um, um, you know, clinging on the Chinese Eastern Railway um, and the Soviet uh, sort of, you know, advisors uh, in uh, and uh, penetration, right, Soviet penetration of Chinese politics, that, that all these things that were happening in the early 1920s made a big impression on, uh, in Japan. And uh, uh, these developments in China only proved to the Japanese that the Soviet Union was an heir or was the heir to Imperial Russia. So both uh, were empires and uh, both were interested in um, uh, kind of keeping and maintaining this, this sphere of influence in East Asia. So since 1921, the expression of Soviet imperialism uh, was widely used um, in Japan. So this is sort of one trend. On the other hand, right, since the late 19th century, as just Elizabeth um, uh, uh, talk now, right? Uh, since the late 19th century, Japan was fascinated with Russian literature and with social, with Russian social revolutionary sort. Uh, major Russian writers uh, were uh, widely translated and read um, in uh, in Japan. 
um, Japanese visited Tolstoy um, as well in Krasnaya Poliana. By the way, I think the Chinese translated uh, many Russian writers from the Japanese, not directly from Russian, but um, Japan was actually this sort of hub uh, through which all knowledge was kind of moving in, in the region. Um, and the J Chinese also learned about Marxism and socialism from the Japanese first. Um, so Dostoevsky, Chekhov, Turgenev uh, were uh, most popular foreign writers. Um, and a lot of Japanese arrived to socialism and communism by the way of the Russian literature. Um, it's interesting that in the 1910s, 1920s, Tolstoy was the most popular, but in the 1930s in wartime Japan, that's how we call it, 1930s, 1940s, the wartime Japan, Dostoevsky became uh, more popular than Tolstoy. And you can think about why, you know, why Dostoevsky not Tolstoy. Um, so Narodniki, Russian populists, uh, were extremely uh, popular and very admired uh, in Japan as, as in China. That's I, I learned from Elizabeth's book. Um, and also inspired Japanese own populist groups and parties. Um, in 1910, there was an assassination plot in, in Japan to kill the Meiji emperor. And uh, the, um, the arrested um, anarchy socialists, they confessed that they were inspired by the Russian populists um, and they were inspired by the assassination of Alexander II. So they wanted to repeat the same in, with the major emperor. Um, so in general, uh, not only uh, Japanese sort of um, left-leaning public, but also Japanese political elites and even the military were attracted to the Russian critique of Western capitalist modernity. Um, there was a lot of suspicion in Japan, as you know, as Japan is going through this very rapid uh, modernization and as the social ills, you know, becoming really visible um, in Japan, they are, they are kind of reading these Russian critiques of, um, of Western capitalism and, um, and you know, suspicion about cap capitalism was uh, widespread in Japan. It was, uh, it's famous on the left and on the right. Um, and so they are uh, finding a lot of inspiration in, Japan, in uh, Russian literature and Russian um, uh, social thought. Um, so I argued in my book that these two opposite images of Russia as a threat and as this inspiration um, determined the way Soviet communism was received and interpreted in Imperial Japan. So another theme is anarchism. Um, in Japan as well as in China and elsewhere as well, Jap um, in the late 1910s, anarchism was more popular than, um, than socialism. Um, when, um, when the Comintern uh, sent uh, its first envoys, its agents to Japan, uh, to invite uh, Japanese socialists to its meetings and congresses, the order was specifically to target Japanese anarchists um, as being more mobile, more active, and um, uh, more popular among uh, increasingly militant uh, Japanese workers. So those envoys were actually Koreans and Chinese, uh, among whom uh, also was Zhou Enlai, uh, uh, who is also coming up in Elizabeth's book. Um, one of the uh, main anarchists, main Japanese anarchists, Osugi Sakai, he went to Shanghai in 1920, where he met Chinese and Korean um, socialists, and uh, Grigory Vaitinsky, who was the, um, you know, who was working uh, in Shanghai. A, in a, leading this commentary branch. Um, so Osuki left some uh, notes uh, and uh, diaries about his trip to Shanghai. Um, and he was, uh, as according to him, he was taken aback by the self-righteousness, uh, as he writes, self-righteousness and almost missionary zeal of, of, uh, of, Russian, of Russian communists. Um, so he was very soon, um, he soon turned um, against the Soviet Union. He was very disappointed as anarchists elsewhere, right? He was disappointed in the diminishing role of the workers Soviets in Russia. 
Um, he found the Russian Communist Party too dictatorial, too centralized. And so his disappointment actually led him to publicly support the Japanese intervention in Siberia. Um, so he supported the Japanese interventionist troops, the Japanese army, hoping that they would actually end the Bolshevik regime. Um, so now about the differences. Um, Japan was very different from China, obviously, because uh, the fact was that, the Japanese, that Japan was an empire. Uh, Japan was an empire, it possessed uh, uh, Taiwan, Korea, um, and uh, had you know, extensive influence in South Manchuria. Um, and um, so this Japan's uh, engagement with communism and the Soviet Union has to be placed within this imperial context. Um, so a lot of anxieties about the Soviet Union and communism, as well as hopes, um, were related to this growing advance of communist ideas and the Soviet presence in China and colonial Korea. So what, what, I, was, I, what I can argue actually in my book is that um, the Japanese were not so much concerned with communism in Japan rather than with um, popularity of communism in colonial Korea and in China. Um, so even the Russian Bolsheviks in the 1920s realized the importance of Japan. So Japan was actually important. That is not very much discussed, but um, the uh, Russian Bolsheviks in the 1919 and 1920 um, you know, were very preoccupied with this Japan question. Um, so Grigory Zinoviev, uh, the first uh, head of the Comintern, um, said in 1922, I quote, uh, there is no issue in East Asia that didn't involve the Japanese empire. The Japanese proletariat held the key to the solution of the Far Eastern question and would decide the fate of several hundred million people living in China, Korea, and Mongolia, end of quote. So Zinoviev in the same speech, he also predicted that the next world war, so he's talking in 1922, right? So pre he predicted that the next world war would happen in the Pacific and that would be a catalyst and a once in a lifetime opportunity for the Japanese proletariat to topple the imperial regime. Um, and uh, once that would happen, once the, 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 the Japanese empire would collapse, uh, then, you know, as a wave, it would sort of liberate uh, the rest of uh, East Asia. Um, okay, um, so the, when we talk, or when, you know, students of global communism um, talk about uh, the Soviet Union and, and, and communism um, and the spread of, sort of communism, um, in case of East Asia, it's often, you know, about China, Korea, Vietnam, Mongolia, occasionally. Um, and those countries come to mind first. Uh, and Imperial Japan is often excluded from this conversation, um, despite the fact that uh, Imperial Japan controlled those territories where uh, these communist parties um, succeeded eventually. Um, so my last sort of uh, big um, topic is related to this fact, uh, um, to this issue of, of the relationship between the Japanese communists and Russian communists. So in the late 1920s, the Japanese left split into two groups. Um, one group um, didn't think that the Russian revolution was the universal revolutionary model. Um, neither as they agreed with the Comintern sort of seizes on Japan, right? With the Comintern plans for Japan, uh, be, because they uh, they uh, realized that uh, the Comintern and people in Moscow didn't have actually good knowledge of Japanese history and the Japanese economy. Um, so the Comintern seizes on Japan, that which were issued in 1927 and in 1932, um, essentially argued that. Um, Japan um, uh, was still a sort of a semi-feudal country. Um, it was backward um, and it needs to accomplish a, a bourgeois revolution. And uh, the second um, sort of uh, directive was that the Japanese left 
must prioritize the needs of the Chinese revolution rather than the needs of the sort of revolution within Japan. Um, so, the, so this was one group. And the second group agreed with the Comintern assessment, uh, with the Comintern sort of directives. Um, and, uh, but what is important in this is that the Comintern thesis and the debates uh, over it sparked a very rich, uh, very theoretically rich debates in Japan on the nature of Japanese capitalism. And the conclusion of this debate uh, was that the Japanese state was essentially backward and that it was abnormal uh, by, because it combined both capitalist and feudalist elements. And this understanding of Japan, uh, which was inspired by the commenter, by the Moscow assessment you know, of, of modern Japanese state. So these uh, conclusions became the main explanatory framework of Japanese history, history until the late 1970s. So we have from basically from 1920s until 1970s, the main orthodoxy, right? The main sort of um, um, framework to talk about Japanese history was actually inspired by the Comintern um, um, thesis on Japan. Um, so I think, um, I think I will finish here because I want to uh, have a sort of um, to um, read questions from the audience as well. Um, so my last sort of my last comment is, um, as I mentioned before, right, the J Imperial Japan is often excluded from this discussion of global communism and, this, and, and the influence of the Soviet Union on Soviet Union East Asia, um, and. Um, but you know, Japan was important because it was an empire, um, and the, the kind of uh, most powerful, uh, the biggest power in uh, in Asia, and the Soviet policies in East Asia were not uh, were formulated not only with regards to China but also with regards to Imperial Japan. Um, so domestically within Japan, right, uh, international communism and the Soviet Union. Um, also uh, had a big um, influence on Japanese history um, from, you know, from this sweeping crackdown on the opposition and the emergence of a police state in Japan in the 1930s um, to the Japanese expansion in Manchuria, which was often justified as a defense measure against the Soviet Union. Um, so I think, um, I think I will stop here. Thank you. Great. Well, first of all, uh, thank you to Professor McGuire and Professor Linkoyeva for those for those great talks, and thanks to everyone, all the attendees for for coming today. Um, I'm going to take some questions, which again, feel free to put them into the Q and A uh, window in just a second. But First, I wanted to ask Professor McGuire if, if she wanted to comment on, on, on some of the affinities between uh, these two projects and these two books and the ways in which the, the Soviet Union and the Soviet project exert a fascination for um, Chinese radicals for both the left and the right in Imperial Japan, um, whether that's motivated by attraction or by fear, um, you know, we're we're sort of looking out from both of those perspectives this week at the at the at the image that's constructed of the Soviet Union and the attraction that it holds. So, I just want to turn it over to Professor McGuire to sort of comment on the connections between these two works, and then I'll take some questions. I'll try to be brief since I went over time in my talk. Um, I just want to reiterate. Um, Tatiana's point about this kind of dual vision of um, Russia and the Soviet Union as being a threat and then being an attraction. And even in the minds of the first wave, like Chen Duxiu, you know, founder of Chinese Communist Party, those two images existed, um, you know, kind of in the, at the same moment and, you know, in their minds. And the only reason that I, 
and I talk about that a little bit in my book. And I think with my book, I, you know, I was trying to correct something, right? I was, so I didn't, I didn't as much as Tatiana did so nicely. I wasn't focused as much. And yet all of those things like the Soviets clinging to the railroad um, or Mongolia um, and, but for the Chinese, there's this moment in the twenties when these common turn operatives arrive and it's the twenties. And so they're, um, expounding this idea of ending Russian imperial influence in China. And it's just a brief moment, right? They go back to being seen as th not so much threatening, but just imperialists. Um, but there's this brief moment and you can see it in memoirs. They describe these Russians they meet as quote, a new Russian. They say, this is a new type of Russian, unlike the old ones. And so they have to justify in their minds. Um, I want to say also that um, Dostoevsky never took off too much in China until much later, which I think is kind of interesting. Um, and then last but not least, I'll answer a question from the um, Q&A real quick to say um, that I don't think that the Manchu identity was too um, strong because by then, you know, they'd overthrown the Manchu empire. And um, so they were looking for an escape from national identity and an entry into an international world. And so at least when I, the stuff that I found didn't emphasize that. Um, but I just want to say that the Chinese were in school with Japanese, like you know, there was Sun Katayama, and sorry, I don't, I don't speak Japanese, but um, he was, you know, uh, there, and there was the Japanese group in this school, um, who apparently was more problematic than the Chinese group. They were even more mischievous, and the anarchism was like, really, like, oh, no more anarchism for these Japanese. So um, I would just say that, you know, I found a friend, our books should like go on vacation together. That's all I'll say. I now. think that's that's definitely right. And uh, Professor Linkoyo, do you want to comment on that? Um, what I was thinking about that I look at this um, at that uh, university, um, the Communist University in Moscow, and um, you know, and just in general thinking about Chinese who are coming to uh, to Russia in thousands, but um, the Japanese actually, I mean, there are who are visiting, uh, there were sort of who, are, who visited um, Russia, but you know, it's a few dozens, it was never in thousands. Um, and um, in the early 1920s, it's maybe like 20, so yeah. this is not sort of, I, I'm not looking at this, uh, I didn't look at the social history of uh, these people who've actually stayed in Russia. Um, but I know, I mean, I read some memoirs. Um, um, uh, and it, this is the question that's more about sort of Japanese history, why they didn't, uh, there were, no more, there were uh, not more people um, visiting, visiting Russia. Why, why was that? Um, and why sort of might so many uh, from China? Um, and um, another kind of, I, I, I knew about this and uh, this is sort of the weakness of the book, I think, uh, of my book, um, is that I didn't look at women. Um, I didn't look at, they were, there were socialists and communist women, uh, also wives. Um, but they don't feature that much in my book. Um, and I think there were no romances between the Japanese um, in Moscow and uh, Russian women. I, I, I don't remember anyone who yeah, got together. I yeah, I didn't follow it, but that's interesting. It, yeah, and it's again, it tells you more about China and Japan, the differences. Um, yeah, it does. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna take uh, a question here for um, Professor Lenkhoeva from C.G. Zhang. It, the question is, if there are previous works comparing the disputes between uh, the Japanese left and the Japanese right during the interwar period with those that come in the, in the 1960s, and 
is it possible to sort of compare those two moments of of uh, of disagreement? Um, so the, uh, this what is interesting about the Japanese? I didn't mention didn't talk about this, but what is interesting about the Japanese right in the 1920s, they are actually very pro-Soviet. Um, they very support the Russian Revolution, they support the Bolshevik regime, but mainly because they understood it as anti-Western uh, revolution, as anti-imperialist and you know, revolution. And you know, right, that uh, the, the Bolsheviks began to this, project this image of anti, of the revolution as anti-imperialist revolution as they're trying to capture uh, people, I mean, trying to win support in the Middle East, in Central Asia, as well as in East Asia. Um, and so they are very attracted to this anti-imperialist, anti-Western uh, message of the Russian, uh, of the of the Bolsheviks. Um, and so they supported very much. That changed again because of the uh, growing presence of the Soviets in East Asia. Um, but still, even the, in the 1930s and 1940s, the right, um, uh, uh, the right wing, um, you know, actually is supporting some sort of um, um, alliance with the Soviet Union um, against the Anglo-American imperialism. So they sought much more closer. So you know, there are talks about continental, a continental block or Eurasian block, um, and so they felt much more clo uh, much closer to the Russians rather than to the uh, Americans. And that's that's very interesting. Um, in um, the, this this kind of line of thinking, it um, it um, it stayed after the Second World War. But World War II was such a shock. I mean, so many things changed. The American occupation, you know, um, the destalinization was a, was a big shock for the Japanese left, um, and that uh, the the American occupation as well. So what is happening very briefly with the Japanese left after 1945 is that they now consider Japan as a colony, as an American colony. Um, and, um, and so there is a lot of this kind of um, um, sort of the sense of victimhood, you know, uh, being uh, victims of imperialism. Um, so I don't know if we can make this direct line between the in interwar and post-war periods. Thanks. So we have a number of questions and not too much time. So I'm going to take mm -hmm. two here and I'll just paraphrase. We have a question from Nicholas Fitztum um, about basically about the Communist University of the Toilers of the East. And I think that's an interesting question to ask both of our presenters sort of what role that institution plays um, in both of their stories, and you know, obviously, it's a major part of uh, a Soviet anti-imperial strategy. A Soviet uh, turn to the colonized world. So, um, that's one question about the University of the Toilers of the East, and another question from uh, Sohi Ryuk, um, again for for both speakers, which is. Um, uh, about the significance of the transmission of ideas across borders. Uh, so he writes, if we move beyond a focus on the spread of political ideologies into cultural, romantic, and social aspects, how does this type of perspective change our perceptions of how ideas were transformed, experienced, and transmitted? I can um, take a stab. I, I was keeping track of the chat and there were a lot of questions in there about communist university toilers of the east so i'll just speak for a minute or two about that um you know there were people from all over the world and they even somehow lumped um black americans into the toilers of the east um basically this was anyone who wasn't from europe who wasn't white um they put there somebody asked about the sources there's a in the common turn archive there's actually the Communist University of Toilers of the East. And then through the 1930s, that there, there is then a university just for the Chinese for like five years. And then there's another very top secret underground school. And that's where the Manchu revolutionaries were. And that one was actually run by Kong Sheng, who was like the barrier of China. Um, so, and somebody asked about keeping track, like who kept track of them? Well, the thing is 
somebody needs to go write a dissertation about this university. It's my view, the reason that they haven't yet is that each section is organized according to its nationality. So ironically, you know, in this international um, context where these revolutionaries are side by side, um, they're keeping track na on national basis and they kind of delegate leaders of those groups um, who are bilingual and they are actually making weekly reports about them and they're, they're talking with, um, um, you know, both GPU and um, uh, the, the Eastern delegation of the Comintern about all of this stuff. And literally, you know, I could show you passages where they go on and on about some Chinese guy who left his wife and it's causing trouble and another one who raped someone and then another one who's fallen, three people have fallen in love with the cafeteria worker Marfa, you know, and it just goes on. Um, so if you're interested, the only issue is that most of the materials are in the native languages. So yes, there are Russian language materials in there, but to really do it and do it right. And on top of that, they're handwritten. And, you know, I was a new, new reader of Chinese and on top of that Chinese language was in a transition. Um, and so to do that right, uh, you have to know a lot of languages. And so, you know, I don't know how anyone would write a history, but if you're interested in a specific place, definitely go because it's so easy to find. Um, and I, I'll just stop there since I talked longer than I wanted to. Um, and I don't even know if I answered the question. Um, about this, if I understood correctly the question, um, about how the ideas traveled. Um, so in case of Japan, um, it was a, lo a lot was mediated by, uh, Koreans um because hello um because the um, i remember the uh commenter had a branch in irkutsk um and they um uh, there is a lot of like talk they cannot find anyone who speaks japanese um and the only people who spoke ja hello uh the only people who spoke japanese in um, Japan. I think I froze. No, he's connected. It looks like you froze a little bit. Um, do you want to just repeat that you were speaking about um, Japanese language? His hmm. language. People who spoke Japanese were Koreans, um, and so it was were Koreans who spoke between Russia and Japan. I right. can take yeah. a couple more if you want. Oh, Sam, I don't want to um, override your role. I know I could just take a couple more questions from the um, chat, or you could summarize them. Yeah, well, we're just sort of running low on time, um, but. Uh, why I will there's sort of one that I'm interested in uh, certainly which is uh, which is from Maria Melentieva about sort of uh, you know given the colonization policies of the of the Soviet state in the late 20s um, what were the sort of references to socialists of uh, or I guess um, let's just say national minorities uh, within Russia in in Japan and China what was that kind of discourse like. Um, I can actually answer that. It was a fascinating question to me. So one of my main protagonists, Chu Chiu Bai, um, was very much involved in creating a written, um, a transliteration system. And even they wanted to, because there's a lot of Chinese workers in the Far East, so they want to teach them to read. And along the lines of Koronizatia, what they were doing everywhere, they wanted to give them a language and they wanted it to be simpler. And so they originally envisioned that it would be in pinyin, you know, with Latin letters. And Chu Bai was very involved in that. Um, and then, you know, it didn't, the move away from that didn't really affect them. 
you know, I mean, they did drop the idea of giving opinion. And in fact, later on, Mao and Stalin had a conversation and Mao's like, should I make the language all opinion? And Stalin is like, no, don't do that. That's your culture. <laughs> so. Tatiana, what about, um, yeah. You know, but I, I was actually kicked out of Zoom for a bit, so I, I missed the question. So we can go ahead, maybe. Yeah. Sure. Um, so another there's a question here from Clayton Black about the archives. And I think that uh, both of you and also uh, myself, to a certain extent, are kind of denizens of Erga Spee. And we spent a lot of time <laughs> in that reading room and in the Comintern uh, archives there. Um, and so I wonder if you could both talk a little bit about um, your sources and what it's like working with those archives. And also about, I guess the question uh, is about sort of finding the romance within those stories or finding um, the, the connection between historical questions that you're interested in and people's personal lives. And within those archives, from my experience, there are a lot of very compelling personal stories, individual stories. Yes. Um, in, in an archive that's about very large institutions. So maybe you could both speak to that. Yes. Um, and again, short-term memory is bad for me right now, <laughs> but um, you're talking about working in those archives. Well, you know, you're ordering these large diela, you know, and you're sorting through, um, but it's pretty obvious when, you know, like, it hits you in the face, these interpersonal things, like you're saying, um, Sam, It and it's such a shock and a surprise. I didn't think I'd be able to center my book on a romance theme. Like I, I, I liked it, but I didn't think I'd be able to do it until I was in those archives. And like, there's my favorite document is like, on love literature and revolution after reading The Sorrows of Young Werther, like in Chinese, which is halfway between traditional and simplified Chinese and goes on this long rant about this. And so on the one hand, working in those archives is cold and you're ordering tons of stuff and it's, you get so overwhelmed and yet there's such gems in there so that anyone who's interested in a revolutionary movement that was going on at the time should go there. And even, you know, in the thirties, there's follow-up organizations that are like underground and those are super fascinating. Um, like Mao's wife was in one of those and eventually she goes to work as a nanny in this school that I'm writing the second book about and then she's committed to an insane asylum. So like, as far as these personal stories, like you will find them and you just have to sit there in the cold ordering lots of yellow. So I looked at the, um you know, there is this volumes, right? Comintern and Japan, Comintern in Japan, I think. Um, and uh, it's all very dry, you know, about this political agenda. But then there will be some uh, letters, which, which was, it was, I was sitting alone and laughing. Um, so the, the, and this is actually a global story, right? A, a story of global communism. As elsewhere in Japan, some really strange people joined the Japanese Communist Party and traveled to Moscow. They would get, or Shanghai uh, met the Comintern, would get money, um, a lot of money, and diamonds in some cases, and you know, for their, uh, for the party expenses, and they would disappear. Uh, these people, uh, these Japanese, they would disappear with this money, and then uh, in one case, uh, the the party's um, activity was paralyzed for almost a year because Moscow said we don't have money for you anymore, and that guy disappeared with all the money, and then uh, or they would get money uh, and uh, they would you know dry up very quickly, and this uh, very prominent Japanese. Japanese communists would they would write these very apologetic letters, um, like we are sorry, we you know this is not the, the, our uh, we are not like this, and <laughs> it's, it's it's just interesting to read um, these apologies. Yeah. Can I just I know we're um, out of time, but I just want to 
because Tatiana, you said it's a story of global revolution. Mm -hmm. And I just wanna make a short little preview advertisement for my second book, which is called Communist Neverland, History of an International Children's Home. Because a lot of these people had children who left them there. This home has people from like every part of the globe and they grow up as Russian speakers. It's a neverland. It's a neverland metaphorically and actually. And through that, one institution, I plan to tell a new story about global communism that's sort of encapsulating a lot of these themes of interaction and family, et cetera. So I just wanted to say that I'm coming out with another book. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, thank you both. And we are uh, pretty much out of time here, over time. Uh, we apologize if we couldn't get to everyone's questions, but I think we had some really good ones and a really good discussion here today. So um, I will just sort of sign off by saying that if you are interested in the other uh, upcoming talks in this uh, Russia's World series at the Harriman, uh, they are on the Harriman website and they we will resume, I believe, at the, sort of at the end of January uh, next year. Um, but thank you again to both of our panelists at, for today's uh, event and to everyone in attendance. And we hope to see you uh, in the new year. <laughs>